Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Chris Gandy, one of your co-hosts for Advisor Today podcast, where we feature some of the top uh, speakers and some of the top professionals in the insurance and financial services industry. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Suzanne Carawan. Hi, Suzanne. Hey, Chris. And our guest, Mark, uh, Mr. Marcus Ogden. Marcus, you want to say hello real quick? How you doing? Thanks for having me on, Chris and Suzanne. Appreciate it. All right. So um, really quickly, um, Suzanne, who is our sponsor for today's podcast? So today is a really special podcast. Um, it is brought to you by NAFA's Talent Development Center, which is where our DEI initiative is housed. And today we get a sneak preview of our upcoming eighth annual DEI symposium that will happen the morning of Monday, May 22nd from 8 to 12 noon at the JW Marriott in D.C., where today uh, Marcus Ogden is actually one of our keynotes. We get a little taste test here before we actually get to see Marcus uh, in full kind of full main stage performance. So if you haven't registered, it's a free event where actually it's a give back that NAFA does to the industry. Uh, please consider joining us. So again, May 22nd, morning of, completely free. You go to um, belong.nafa.org. You'll see it on our events tab. And we would love to join you. NAFA is really serious about being able to move the needle forward on creating a diverse workforce and ensuring that we have advisors who reflect a changing Main Street USA. So we're going to hear a little bit about Marcus's incredible story today as we uh, as we get to know him. Marcus, welcome. Welcome. So, you know, I, I typically jump out in front just simply because, um, you know, uh, I, I tend to ask what I would call interesting questions. So so we'll, we'll jump we'll jump right in. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the insurance and financial services industry. Yeah. So my name is Marcus Ogden. I am from Washington, D.C. I went to Howard University. I actually studied finance at Howard where I graduated. I played in the National Football League for almost six years, but I also have worked in financial industry. I worked for Merrill Lynch for a short time. I interned at Merrill Lynch when I was in college playing for the Bison. And my dad was one of the first African-American bank managers for the Federal Home Loans Bank of New York in their D.C. <laughs> office. He was the bank manager. I think it was either 1978 or 1979 that he got that position. So I've been around finance economics, you know, financial information my entire life. So I loved finance, you know, in high school and college. And of course, after the NFL, I tried to go into the industry again when I left the National Football League. And so you, you hit a bunch of points there. So let's let's kind of dive into that. So your journey, I mean, is this what you went to school for? Did you go to school to say, hey, I'm going to be either in the financial management world or the insurance world? And how did you determine kind of which space that you focused on? Yeah, I definitely wanted to work in the financial industry. I wanted to work on Wall Street. That was always my first love when I went to college because my dad worked in downtown DC in the finance industry and financial industry. So I always had that as my goal, as my desire. And when I got to Howard on a full scholarship, I said, wow, I'm at Howard University. I'm here for free. I have an opportunity to play football. I'm going to do the best I can. If I, be, if I become a starter for a year, maybe two, that's okay. Let's go to school to really study finance. And I interned at Merrill Lynch my redshirt sophomore year, and I loved it. And so I was prepping to finish up college and try to go to Wall Street through Merrill Lynch and get a job. But the National Football League and the Jacksonville Jaguars had other plans for me when I was drafted by them in 2003 in the NFL draft. And it was awesome because I had a chance to be around great athletes and things of that nature. But I learned a lot of financial management and budgeting and how to be more of a planner and a thinker. So when I got to NFL, when I made my money, right, Chris and Suzanne, I kept my money and I was able to understand how to you know, budget and allocate. And, you know, I had my expenses, I mean, my income, what I was going to do here, going to do there. So what I learned from my father and from Howard and from working at Merrill Lynch really taught me a lot in my life of how to be financially savvy in the National Football League. 
NFL. So the NFL, huh? So no, most people don't get a chance to actually even go to NFL football games, let alone grace the field of yeah. uh, being able being able to play. Um, I noticed you didn't mention what position did you play? What position were you uh, were you playing? Were you drafting it? Yeah, I was drafted as an offensive lineman. So uh, I played tackle at Howard, and then when I got to the NFL, I was drafted as a tackle. And of course, you know, as a rookie lineman, you play guard, tackle, you know, center. You kind of get moved around and kind of get to know your toughness and can you compete against guys that are fast, guys that are big. So it was great. And I played with some great guys on the O-line. I played with some great guys on the D-line. I like Marcus Stroud, John Henderson, just some juggernaut. So I was an O-lineman at Howard, and I was drafted into that position by the Jaguars. So Howard, a, a HBCU, which is a traditional uh, minority uh, and diverse, you know, uh, program, right? Uh, you know, his four black college and university. So, so, but they're not necessarily known for football, right? I mean, they're known, but they're, they're known more academically than they are for their sports program. So how did you stand out? People will say you have to go to a big school to stand out. So how did you stand out at Howard? What I did, Chris, was I utilized the skill sets that I was taught by my brother, who was the offensive lineman in the NFL for the Ravens at the time. But I also had a great coach in Fred Dean, who played for the Washington Redskins as an O-lineman, who taught me a lot. And then what I did was I just performed every time on the football field. Every game, I gave it my best. I did my best. I trained hard. I worked out. I was in the weight room. I was always in the classroom. I was always in the film room. Like my college career, the five years I was at Howard, I can probably count on both hands how many times I actually went out, like clubbing, partying. I mean, I mean, I did every once in a while with my teammates, but that wasn't it for me. I focused on my schooling, the game, and especially going to my last year, Chris at Howard, when I was in in uh, draft books, they well, if he has a great last year and great numbers and goes to a bowl and he can actually be drafted. I just kind of got lasered in. And as a insurance salesman, a financial, uh, a financial analyst working in these fields, you have to lock in and attack. Focus like a laser that is going to cut through a diamond. When you focus and you know what you want and what you want to get achieved, you can achieve it and push forward towards that that achievement, that goal, that desire. And I did that. And as a result of that, Chris and Suzanne, 12 months later, I was drafted to the National Football League from there. So are you are you a write the goals down kind of guy? Are you the visualization person? Like what, what are your tools that you use to get clear on that and stay, have that tenacity to stay on track? I am a big write your goals down and go after what you want kind of guy all day, every day, because that's truly how I feel you're going to turn a dream into reality. Because if it's just in your mind, it's a thought and or a wish. But once you see it out on paper, once you, you know, it's like it goes from here to out in front of you and you can actually see it and you can target it and you can go after it. I feel, Suzanne, it makes it that much more tangible, that much more real, which makes you what? Want to go after and pursue it relentlessly and endlessly. When you look at the journey um, of financial services, once you were in the NFL and you transitioned, um, how hard has it been for you to establish footing in the insurance or financial services industry and make a name for yourself like you did in in football? It's always difficult because for me, when I left, I then got into construction and I wasn't prepped to go to financial industry because I just hasn't, I didn't really know how to make that move. So what I did when I got into, you know, construction, I got into, you know, all those type of things. And as a result of that, it was really still hard for me, right, Chris, to make that move because I didn't have any type of, you know, understanding or any type of real 
knowledge of how to actually make the move. So for people that are listening, if you're trying to establish yourself in this industry, it's like any other industry. You have to stand out and you don't want to blend in. And you stand out by getting out in front of people, knowing your unique selling proposition or your unique value proposition, and just being very consistent and capitalizing on opportunities. An opportunity is a chance to do or create something great. You should lean on your trusted network, do what you do best and leverage your strengths, and take calculated risk in what you're doing. Because again, in order to succeed in financial and insurance industries, you have got to stand out. You can't blend in. If you're blending in, right, Chris and Suzanne, it's hard to find you to move you into the right direction. I mean, it's safe. It's safe. But if you're if your you know, career is built on prospecting, you know, you're probably not going to you're not going to do so well. Right. You got to set yourself up for success. Great quote by Jonah Hill, the actor. The comfort zone is where dreams go to die. And I think about our podcast, the Get Authentic with Marcus Ogden show. We're in the top 1% in the world, most popular. We're nine months old. And I was scared to death to start that podcast. Who's going to like it? Who's going to listen? You did another podcast and you got burnt. You know, is this going to work? And uh, Who's going to sponsor? I mean, I could go down the list. But mm-hmm. I said, you know what? The heck with it. If I'm going to coach people on how to step out of their company, so I got to do the same thing launched it, and boom, here we are. So again, you can't stay in the comfort zone in anything in life because you're never going to reach your full potential. So share with us your day-to-day now. I mean, you, you, you mentioned kind of this journey and this, this, uh, this path that you, you've taken um, from power to the NFL, to the, to the financial, to, to an industry and in to the financial industry. I mean, share with us a little bit of what you're doing now. And you mentioned a podcast. Tell us if we tuned into the podcast, what, 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 what can we expect? So if you tune into the podcast, right, Chris, you can expect one thing, amazing people sharing amazing stories. That's it. We've had athletes, actors, actresses, comedians, business owners, financial, you know, industry experts. You know, we've had people that are in insurance. We have people that are in manufacturing, uh, uh, the food service industry, hospitality. We're no bounds. We have no limits, Chris, to who we offer an invite to our show. As long as you want to share your story and give our audience tips and or tricks to help them in their life, you fit well. So we kind of take a Joe Rogan approach to our guests, but we focus more on positivity, inspiration, and building up people. There's no negativity. There's no controversy because people can get that a lot of their podcasts and that's not what we're about. So my day-to-day, I'm up every morning. If I, if I, uh, if I have my daughter, because I'm going through a separation, if I have my daughter, I'm up by 5.30, taking her to school, going to the gym. And from there, I get my day started with work, you know, prospecting, calling people, meetings, all that. If I don't have my daughter, I'm up by five, I'm at the gym, doing all my early bird, uh, all my early bird errands. Then I'm prospecting sales calls, or on Tuesdays, I shoot my podcast with my guests or I'm looking to book people on podcasts, going on great podcasts like this one with you and Suzanne. It's full of getting our brand out there. There's four key areas in successful business, marketing, sales, operations, finance. It all starts with marketing though, Chris and Suzanne, because if people don't know you exist, how in the world can they buy your product? Again, stand out. Don't blend in, but I'm very hardworking. And I also, Chris, I'm sure you know as a former athlete, live by my schedule. Like Mm -hmm. I have a lot of brotherhood that struggle with life and they're struggling now because they don't have a schedule. Like in my phone, in my calendar, boom, I'm checking stuff, boom, doing what I have to do. And what happened? When I finished an item, I delete it, it's out of my phone. 
At the end of the day, I want to see a completely empty schedule, which means I accomplished my day at optimal level. Huh. That's interesting. Um, when you talk about your day, is it is it is your is it is it you? Do you have a team? Do you have how, how, how have you structured yourself so you can expand and grow? Great question. I have a remarkable team. I have a website designer, an internal manager, an external manager, a social media team. I have a trademark and patent person. I have a videographer on, on, my, on te- my team. I have a bookkeeper, a great CPA, right? I cannot do everything by myself. And I, if you're listening to this, if you're starting your business and you don't have a lot of capital, I understand. Figure out what you do well, go after it. What you don't do well, and you don't have a lot of capital, try to barter or find someone to help you and exchange something. Because again, if you try to take everything on by yourself, you will burn out. It's the human mind is designed to do a lot of things, but it's not designed to do everything. So what I used to do, right, Kristen and Suzanne, I would barter with people on my team. And I would trade like, well, I'll help you get a client here and do this there, all that right now. You know, down, you know, you know with one of my team members has been, whew, uh, what's that? Seven, it's been six years. One of my team members has been five years. Oh, it's been three or four, right? Now I'm in a position to pay people for mm-hmm. their time and mo- on a monthly retainer basis. And I feel good about that because all those people, right, Chris and Suzanne, they stuck with me when I had nothing, when I was in building mode. And because of that, now I spend my time marketing, prospecting, or doing things to increase our visibility, shooting our podcast, or publishing episodes, or going on podcasts, or trying to get into print, magazines, whatever, right? So I focus more on the business and less in the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so are, is it safe to say that now you've completely gone to being a full-time speaker, you know, kind of a full-time influencer and speaker and and all of that, that's really what you're doing now full-time. Correct. And I am consulting, coaching, podcasting, and I'm a brand ambassador. And I also own parts of the businesses that align with me and my value system of who I am as an individual, which allows me to really be passionate about what I do. And I'm excited for NAFA because everything is going to tie back to finance. Everything. If, you, if you're in business, you have to make money, right? But you have to also understand to build something special, you have to have the right special people around you. And it takes time to find the right team. But as you grow, understand if you don't add great people, you'll never reach your full potential. It's just not possible. So you've di- you've diversified those cash flows. <laughs> so I- oh, 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 let's talk about that. That's yeah. Suzanne. I make money, keynote speaking, coaching, consulting, podcast, people sponsoring our podcast. Mm-hmm. I have a PR side of our business that where I help people want to get onto podcasts or other forms of media, do that. Book sales. Uh, I make money through being a business owner, right? I make money through appearances. I have eight to 10 ways of making income. Let's just be real. Right now, I got an email in my, in my mailbox is NAFA's deposit check for my speaking. And I'm like, wow, it's kind of funny. The deposit here, I'm doing it in the podcast. That's pretty awesome. But again, never, ever rely on just one source. You always want to have multiple streams of income because if one dries up, you don't want to come across to your client base desperate to close a sale. And that's where I struggle as the speaker in the beginning and even financial services when I was working for Merrill Lynch for a short time, I was desperate. You could see it in my face. You could hear it in my voice. When I came to a meeting, if I didn't close it, I was like, how am I going to eat? So like, it, it just came across as desperate, as no, not confident, and it came across worse of all as transactional and mm. not relationship driven. So let me, let me, I'm going to dissect some of this, right? Um, 
So let's go, let's get granular, shall we? So I'm going to try to draw some parallels, if you wouldn't mind me doing that. Um, my former background life, I'm a recovering athlete myself, so don't judge me. Um, so, you know, with that being said, notice I said recovering athlete because we're all messed up while we're doing what we're doing because we are so focused on being great at that, that the rest of the world is kind of this nebulous place. But and if we believe it revolves around us <laughs> until we realize that it doesn't. And then. The idea of being able to transcend and be as successful, even more successful in another opportunity, a lot of athletes struggle with. So I'm going to go there with you since you seem like you, you you're capable. OK, so. So. Coming from Howard, mm -hmm. let's talk about being a diverse professional in an industry that's predominantly not as embracing or not as opportunistic or opportunities. How did you navigate that? Mm, great question, Chris. I have a cheat sheet answer because it's just the way it is. I had my father who went to Howard University himself, got his master's from the University of Maryland in economics. And my dad worked in that industry for many years before I was born and while I was born. And as I got older, I could lean on him and I could ask him what really mattered. And what I did, I learned how to speak people's language to make them feel comfortable that I could do a job. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, the, and again, communication creates connection. And mm -hmm. I learned how to master communication from my father at a young age. And when I got to Howard and more diversity hit me, not just African American but people from like Haiti, the Bahamas, you know, other countries, England, right. London. And I got a chance to see what that was like and how to try to have the master, the master communication skill set of just being humble and how to approach people and make them feel special. So between Howard, my father, and then interning at Merrill Lynch, and again, I was the only African-American at their office at that time, interning. But I learned how to observe. I learned how to process. And I learned how to, to make a decision and act through what I was hearing, what I was seeing, which allowed me to not be an outsider, which allowed me to say, you know what? I do belong here. And that's why I wanted to go into that field until, of course, I was drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars. So how much of that is innate and how much of that did you learn? I would say probably 60% innate and 40% learn because I've always been a people person. My brother, Chris, first draft pick of the Ravens in NFL history, first battle Hall of Famer, you know, to the Ravens in 2013, regards the best offensive lineman in NFL's history. He's an, he's an introvert, but he's six foot nine, 375 pounds. He was, he was a giant. He was a monster. Even in the NFL, he was big. Yeah. So my brother was always an introvert. I've always been an extrovert. So I learned, and I was always had the innate ability to connect with people, but then I learned how to speak language, which I felt comfortable with, but then come across fake, but also that could connect with people and that really closed the gap for me in that regard. Okay, so 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 what I heard you say was your ability to articulate who you are in connection with what you stand for and what you're willing to actually try and accomplish that you know to I guess that passion that's inside of you helped drive some of the behaviors and then you had you had some guiding principles and individuals around you that could help you not waste time with on some of the nuance, right? You, you know, your father say, okay, you got to pay attention to this and you got to do this. And, and so that's a great, that's a great part of your story. So if I'm a young man starting in this, in an industry like insurance and financial services, what advice would you give me? 
I'm I'm 23 years. I, I'm not young. I know I look a day old, older than <laughs> 22. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been in the business now 23. So 23 years doing this, and I'll enter my 24th year here in May. Now I look back, and um, but I'd like to hear from you. What what would you tell a young professional today? Because the world is different today, right? We have to understand that. What would you tell a young professional today about joining the financial services industry or joining an industry that is traditionally very difficult or hard to have success in? So what I would say is you need to clearly know your why to why you want to get into this business, right? Know your why. And then more importantly, Chris and Suzanne, be able to articulate that why when you're talking to people about what you are doing and start talking to people that are in your trusted network. But again, your trust network is going to be good and bad. They're going to want to talk to you, which is good. But the bad is they're going to know why you're doing what you're doing. If you cannot articulate that why clearly and concisely, you risk them not connecting with you not in, in, on a personal, but on a business level. So again, know your why and be able to articulate that why. But more importantly, when you go to your trusted network, don't waste their time. Know your why, but also know your industry. And if you can get some good momentum with your trusted network, it'll give you confidence and give you the right mindset to be able to move and go down the path towards success in your respective financial planning or financial services or insurance services field. Got so it. I know we hear that a lot, but, but Marcus, maybe I know you do coaching on this too. Do you have any kind of points that you want to give to people out there? Because I think a lot of people, they, they say, yeah, I should know my why, but they struggle actually with identifying that, right? They're, they kind of can come up with some tactical things like I want more money, I want a success, but, but, but like the really thing that motivates them do you have any tips for how you get people to hone in on that? Yeah. Sit down and write out your three biggest strengths that you possess in working in insurance or financial services. Once you come up with those three big strengths, then come up with a mantra and a mission statement around why you're going to use these strengths in this industry. From there, when you're talking to people, use your mission once you're in a meeting, but use your mantra as part of your prospect and get a mantra, five words or less that describes your brand. Just do it. Nike. Information in your hand. Apple. Our mantra, inspire others, sorry, inspire you to take accountability. So hmm. again, use your mantra to help you get to prospecting through the next level and then use your mission statement to guide you through that process. But again, write down your three biggest strengths, come up with your mantra and your mission, and then use those to do what I call elevator pitch prospect. And then when you get to that point of meetings, then you want to sit down with them and say, okay, look, here is, and I'll, and I'll tell them this, you want to master, there's six things of strategic leadership that a good friend of mine, Gary Lane, talks about. Perspective, okay, accountability, leadership, relationships, opportunity, and strategic leadership overall. You want to start really excelling at one and or all of those points as well, because those points are going to help you to, again, create a conduit and or connection in that in that regard. So there's a lot there that people are going to have to rewind this podcast to uh, to kind of di dissect that. So let's talk about DEI, shall we? You're going to come to the DEI summit that's on the forefront of congressional con con or congressional conference. We're going to be in DC collectively um, coming together and uniting to be able to, to uh, uh, hear our, have our voice heard all the way over on, on Capitol Hill. So, so 
what can people expect when they come to the DEI symposium? Specifically, you know, what can they expect when they hear you speak? They can expect me to talk about what DEI means to me. And in reality, DEI is not about talk. It's about action. It's about implementing a better culture, better connection with people to bring about real systemic change. So take our company, right, Chris and Suzanne? I'm African-American. My, my business partner, Dawn, is Caucasian. My website designer, George, is from Lebanon. My, uh, uh, my social media team, they are uh, white, a white female and some Jewish female. My trademark and patent person, African-American male, right? We live by DEI, right? And it's all about coming together from different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, perspectives to solve problems, okay? Don't just talk about what needs to be done. Talk about how you're actually gonna fix something, right? And I feel more people need to just start implementing things and showing people through action. Don't say, well, we believe DEI and I here at this company. We believe DEI here at this company. Well, that's great, but how? Show me. What's your staff look like? What's your people that are making decisions look like? Right? Are you talking to ENI or is your board all one race, all one, one group, all one demographic of age and all one background? If that's what it is, that's not DEI, right? So don't just talk about it, do it. With our construction company, right, Chris and Suzanne, that's what we did. We were DEI. I was African American, my partner was Jewish. We had white uh, male, female out in the white male out in the field, white female in the office. We had Native American. We had people that were uh, Hispanic. We had women. We had African American females. We had it all. We were talking about it. We were doing it. So it's going to really be talking about how you need to start doing these things and make people see your actions. And if you can bring that to the table then you can start seeing some real change. We're going to be talking about that and how you can do that, why it's important, but most importantly, how when you do that, you're going to be able to create better connection with your community, better problem solving. You know, you're going to have more perspectives on how to approach things. You can make more think, more revenue, more profit. All the ties back to better production. But again, don't just talk DEI, live DEI. So I wonder, Marcus, because I wanted to ask you about your kind of talent recruitment, you know, your eye when you're looking for people to join your team. But I'm also guessing, and partly is because you are from Washington, D.C. You're from a global capital. It, it, you know, you see diversity all the time. You've grown up in it immersed. But when you're going out and you're building these teams, though, my guess is you're still, especially since you came from the NFL, you came from an elite school anyway, you're probably still basing it on meritocracy. Am I right in saying that? Because I think that even though you're you're saying DEI, you're not. I think people get. I think they get their. They get very upset, and they their kind of back goes up and the shoulders go up if they think that DEI means you know you're not still basing it on who's the best person for the job. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes, and, absolutely. And here's the thing: if you look hard enough, you'll always find the best person for the job that's diverse. Yeah, don't just hire me to hire me. No, no, no. Don't do that. Hire me because I'm the best at what I do and you want my perspective in your organization to help you thrive. That's DEI. Again, George Thai from Lebanon, best freaking website guy out there to me. Mm -hmm. On my team, Dawn Wiener, our Caucasian female, phenomenal at what she does, writing blogs, newsletters, research, creating images to post for social media. Great. Donovan, African-American male, phenomenal videographer. He is fantastic. Albert, you know, with trademark impact, African-American male. Same thing, right? Then on my team, who is uh, from uh, Vietnam, she's Vietnamese, female, the best of the best at external managers and writing things and PR and outreach and all that stuff. The best of the best. Kylie and her team at social media, those girls are phenomenal. They have a great strategy. They execute. Because here's the thing, right? I'm not going to hire you just to fill a box, 
Not going to do that. Because if I do that, I'm shortchanging myself. Okay? I'm going to hire you and check the box because you're the best of the best. That's and I all think that, me. that you and their coach, Chris, as managers cannot be easy taskmasters <laughs> because oh. you know hard work, right? And you know oh, that yeah. work ethic, et cetera. Yeah. And, and you know what, Susanna, Chris? <laughs> that's why it took me not days, not weeks, not months, years to build this team. Years. It's, it's hard to find, I mean, it's uh, hard, but it's not impossible. No. Right? And no. that's DEI. Wanting the best talent that's diverse that can bring you a unique perspective from their background, their culture, their experiences, and they do their job five star every single time. Mm-hmm. I've heard a, uh, a couple quotes that uh, I'll share with the two of you is just because it's hard doesn't mean it's difficult. Correct. Right. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's difficult. And, and because it's hard doesn't mean that you can't accomplish that. So so you said what well, you said a couple of things. Teamwork makes the dream work. I mean, you've, you've talked about that. You talked about your history, what you're going to bring to the DEI symposium. And you're saying not because. So let me try to articulate not because of my complexion or my connection. I want to be able to bring value. And I want to be able to help you transcend and grow your opportunity and us grow together. That's what I heard you say, I believe. <laughs> That's 100% correct. So I just, I just wanted, to, I wanted to make sure I, I heard, you, heard you correctly. And so with that being said, um, NAFA, you know, you mentioned you're coming to speak at the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. You can speak anywhere you want. Why choose NAFA? Why, why, why NAFA? NAFA to me represents exactly what I'm all about, educating people in their network. Education and empowerment goes hand in hand. And I really love NAFA. My good friend, Jamie Hopkins at Carson Group, you know, really connect me with NAFA. I loved Carla from the first time I spoke with her, Carla Kirk. Loves your mission, loves your values. And as a, as a former financial analyst person myself and an advisor, I know what difficulty lies ahead if you're just starting out or you don't know anybody. But NAFA is trying to close that gap, bridge that gap through education, support, and empowerment. And that's why NAFA was on my list because Jamie Hopkins, Carla Kirk, yourself, Chris, you, Suzanne, everybody is not just speaking what NAFA believes. They are actually living what NAFA believes. And that, to me in itself, speaks volumes. Suzanne, um, before we go to the speed round, which I know he knows what speed is. So <laughs> we're, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can't stump him uh, as we kind of as we kind of go along. But uh, do you have anything else, Suzanne, before we jump to the to the speed round here? Well, I think I think, you know, Marcus is definitely on that list of people we want to invite back. And we can't, you know, we're looking forward to being in person with you, Marcus, May 22nd. But I think other than that, Chris, I think I think let's I think maybe even double up on the speed round because I think Marcus can take it. <laughs> Marcus, this hasn't gone well for a lot of people. <laughs> they, they've been this up, so. That's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm a former athlete like you, Chris. I'm all about the challenge. That's so, right. so, so here's how this works, okay? So the goal of the speed round is whatever comes to mind first, that's just what, what it is, okay? Um, so you don't have to, you know, you don't have to think very hard. It's not one of those situations. It's just like whatever comes to mind, that's that's what it is. So we'll, we'll start off with something very easy. Fair? Your favorite place, your favorite place to eat in Washington and or Washington area. In the Washington area, uh, I would say the uh, oh, the Old Ebbet Grill. Old Ebbet. I ate there last time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very, see how easy. See how easy that was. It wasn't hard. All right. Now we're going to pick it up a little bit. OK, so with right. that being said, so now let's you ready. Let's go. So um, words you remember that your dad told you that you live by. Never, ever judge somebody by what others say. Make your own opinion. 
best advice you heard from a coach that you played for? In life, be your own CEO, Jack Del Rio. Your favorite quote? In times of extreme darkness, focus on the light, Aristotle. Your favorite movie? Rocky Four with Yvonne Drago. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Creed, Creed Three is out though. Just throw I it. saw that. I saw that. <laughs> so your best moments playing, your best moment you can remember from playing sports? Playing my rookie game against the Minnesota Vikings uh, get, with 80,000 fans screaming. And not lose, and not, uh, and not losing my my cool, or 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 just not losing my cool. Okay. Last question: If you could go back in history and have dinner with one person in history, who would it be, and why? Aristotle. He taught and coached Alexander the Great, and he made Alexander the Great one of the best, if not the best, warriors of ancient time through education and empowerment and enlightenment. And I would love to ask Aristotle questions. I would probably use his quotes to the day that I die, which I already do. But I would love to ask him even more questions about his life and what he lived in ancient Greece. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, the mythology major, Suzanne, has spoken. So, mm -hmm. yep. Mr. Marcus, thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, we can't do what we do without professionals like yourself. Um, Suzanne, um, or Marcus, do you have anything before we throw it to Suzanne and then I'll close this out? No, just look forward to the conference again, looking forward to inspiring people with my story. And also we put together some great action steps, how you can start not just speaking about DEI, but living it and creating a better, healthier culture and getting, like you said, right, Chris, great talent that happens to be a different complexion that can do the job at a five-star level. Awesome. Suzanne. Yeah. Do you have I anything think, for us before we, before I close it out? I think, you know, it goes back to that, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, right? Like that whole thing. And I love everything you're saying. And we gotta, we gotta get more people out there and focus. Cause we've got a lot of people in our midst who, they want to do better, but they somehow get blocked, right? And I think that's part of what we're trying to do on this podcast is bring guests on like you, Marcus, and help people open up and uh, find that why and and really kind of kind of live the. We all want to be Chris Gandy, let's face facts, but be able to get into that one percent piece. And we want we want to take our members to that one percent, the top of the top of the financial pyramid. So with that, Chris, I'll turn it back to you. So, with that being said, you heard Mark. You heard Marcus talk a little bit about. How to be better the one well, at least one percent per day in every way possible inspire others around you because this is a bigger this is much bigger than just yourself thank you for tuning in to advisor today's podcast where we uplift and create an environment for professional advisors to build and grow their their careers and thank you so much suzanne for being here thank you marcus for being here we look forward to seeing you soon we'll see you next week thanks for tuning in and again have a great day and go out and inspire somebody to be great, just like yourself. Have a good day. Thanks for joining us for NAPA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.